and so did his talk. I was just, I was so moved by the entire evening. It just fit together so well. So I hope everybody was there felt the same way. So we all know that Will's already a, a great pianist, composer, educator. He's performed and lectured throughout the, the world. He's the author of The World Peace Diet, which he spoke a little bit about and will be talking about today along with, I'm not sure what, I'm sorry, I don't have your subject for today. The spiritual power of food. And if you've gotten the connection that, that Will has with food and spirit, you'll, you're going to be in for a treat here today. Uh, he's won many awards. He's co-founded co the Circle for Compassion Ministry. He's got a PhD from, from Berkeley. And he's really a great, great educator. Uh, he's a Dharma master in Zen tradition. He's devoted to cultural healing and awakening and has created a great set of CDs uh, both for his music and his his book he's got his book on tape and it's really wonderful we have it in our car and we listen to it uh, when we when we drive around it's just really great he's a full-time traveler he's been traveling for was it 12 years now 14. 14 years out of his his RV traveling around the world spreading the this great light and he lectures in retreat centers, does concerts all over the world. So it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Will Tuttle. Dan, and uh, I, you know, it's really. Uh, an honor to be uh, part of this uh, expo and I want to thank all of you for joining us so early on a Sunday morning after that <laughs> I didn't know if I'd be talking to myself here this morning you know, after. <laughs> but I know there's people out there in TV land so um, <clears throat> I'd like to uh, just begin I guess this is uh, you know nine o'clock in the morning Sunday morning it's a beautiful sunny morning here which is a little bit unusual so far and uh, just by taking a moment and just inviting us to turn our attention within and just give thanks for this precious opportunity that we have to be here today and give thanks knowing that all the ripples that radiate from our being together this morning will be to send healing, peace, compassion, awareness, freedom, and love out into our community and into our world. And we give thanks to all of our loved ones, to the whole web of life, to the infinite source of all life. And we give thanks also to ourselves for taking time out of our busy schedules to be here this morning and to focus on that which is within us that is of the nature of wisdom and understanding, that is of the nature of healing and awareness, and that we are part of an awakening on this planet of the human consciousness for a higher expression of peace and that we are here to help celebrate, create the celebration of life that was meant to be. With the power and presence of the infinite spirit, we give thanks knowing this is so, and so it is. All right, so um, I'd like to actually um, re maybe read it one or just very briefly, a couple of quotes from this is the, the book uh, that you've been hearing about. Some of you have perhaps read it called The World Peace Diet uh, that I wrote. And there's a, a chapter in here that's kind of the foundation for the talk this morning, which is called The Metaphysics of Food. How many of you have actually read The World Peace Diet? Maybe I should have a sense. So just, to, okay, so some of you, most of you aren't, haven't read it yet. Okay, so um, the, there's the basic idea here is that religious traditions have always emphasized that, there, that this physical reality is not all there is, that there is a, another dimension. And uh, they've used many different ways of talking about that. Um, in the Zen tradition, uh, which is my essential training is in the Zen tradition. I, I used to teach college co courses in um, comparative religion, and so I've studied um, you know, all the world's major religions. And uh, it's wonderful to see the uh, essential similarity of the teachings that they're essentially emphasizing the importance really of two, two things. One is 
the importance of authentically connecting with something beyond the conditioned mind. Okay, that's, that's number one. Authentically connecting with consciousness, awareness, uh, existence, being beyond the conditioned mind, the mind that we've been programmed with. And if we just stay within that, the programmed mind, we're not going to have anything but that. Just the programming of our culture will continue on. There will be no evolution. There will be no spiritual life at all. We have to question the underlying assumptions of our culture and the underlying conditioning of our culture. So that's one. And usually that's through prayer, through meditation, through um, spiritual practices, through creativity, connecting with nature, something that gets us outside of our normal conditioned consciousness. And then number two is to act in ways that are kind and compassionate to other expressions of life because essentially we're all interconnected. So the idea is that when we awaken spiritually, what we awaken to is the same thing in every tradition, which is the interconnectedness of all life, the essential positive, benevolent quality. I think um, this is something over and over again that spiritual saints and mystics and other people have emphasized is that when we awaken somehow beyond the level of conditioning, what we awaken to is incredibly positive, in a sense, positive beyond positive, <laughs> positive negative, you know, you know beyond du duality. Uh, an, an infinite light, an infinite uh, sense of freedom and, and compassion and a, just a sense of, of realizing that what I am is not just this physical body and its uh, uh, collection, its story, uh, all these things that we sort of contract around and identify with that create misery for us and for others that when, when, you know, the spiritual path is about awakening and expanding and directly experiencing the source that we are. And when that happens, there's automatically a sense of compassion and kindness for the other expressions of the same source because we realize that if I'm in some way doing something to try to get something for myself and harming another, I'm actually harming myself. It becomes kind of comical, you know, it's kind of like, how ridiculous. It's like one finger, you know, beating up another finger, and it's all the same hand. I mean, we're all supposed, you know, it's this, we're all one life, you know, that, that basic idea. And then we realize that our great happiness comes from blessing others. That's the only way, that's the only kind of happiness that's ever attainable is through helping others, blessing others, uh, being, you know, expressing creatively, finding our unique way of blessing others and blessing the world and contributing to the celebration of this life. And so these are the two essential teachings. And inherent in that is the idea of what in the uh, Eastern tradition is called karma, <laughs> which is simply that whatever we sow, we will reap. And this is in every tradition, the idea that whatever we, we put out comes back, that our consciousness and the intention, really, uh, of our actions creates the quality of our lives and creates our experiences so that as we act with a pure consciousness, in a sense, as we act uh, with a motivation to be kind and loving to others, that in the fullness of time, these things all work out. And uh, so, that, so that our behavior really matters. And so it's really interesting to see how virtually all of the spiritual traditions have emphasized um, food that does not cause suffering to other living beings. It's this, and that teaching has been aggressively covered over but by what I call the uh, military, industrial, meat, medical, pharmaceutical, <laughs> media, money complex. You know, <laughs> you know they, they don't want us to think about that. And, uh, and so we don't in, in many ways, because we're, you know, typically in our culture, if we're eating animal-based foods, we're uncomfortable with that, essentially. You know, one of the most amazing things, I remember, um, just, it, it's true, I can see exactly why it's true, but uh, I used to teach courses in mythology, and I was, um, I always love reading Joseph Campbell. Are you familiar with Joseph Campbell, the great mythologist? Back in the 80s, uh, you may remember, he did a series with Bill Moyers, which kind of put him on the map. Before that, he was someone that nobody really knew about. He was sort of this academic guy teaching mythology at Sarah Lawrence College. And so people like me, I had read a lot of his books and things. But I remember in that a series of interviews with Bill Moyers, at one point, Bill Moyers said to Joseph Campbell, so if you could just give us you know, sort of in one, one main reason. Why do we human beings make myths? You know, why do we create these mythic stories that explain reality and, and our, our creation, our relationship with nature, with the animals, with the world, and with each other? And, you know, why do we always, why does every culture have myths? What's the reason? Why do we do that? And it was so interesting because Joseph Campbell said, the one main reason that human beings create myths is to somehow explain 
killing animals for food. I was like, whoa. <laughs> and he said it. You know? And it's true. I mean, if you really go into this, there's always this thing about sacrificing to the Lord. And, you know, I mean, in, in the Old Testament, whenever they, you know, whenever they worshiped the Lord, that meant they stabbed an animal and put it on an altar and, you know, and then ate the animal. I mean, it was this, it's always been this very, very, very uncomfortable with killing animals for food because it goes against our true nature. Uh, and so it's interesting. I, in, in the um, chapter on metaphysics of food, I think is where it is, um, I have a couple of um, quotes from, from different religious teachers. For example, um, I'll just start here. This I, <coughs> let's see, two contemporaries 2,500 years ago, Mahavira, the founder of the Jain tradition, and Gautama Buddha, preached the fundamental spiritual necessity of cultivating an attitude of ahimsa, or non-harmfulness in their followers' relations with both humans and animals. The Buddha says, for example, in the Mahaparinirvana Sutra, quote, eating meat destroys the attitude of great compassion. The 12th century Tibetan Buddhist poet Saint Milarepa sings, quote, accustomed long to contemplating love and compassion, I have forgotten all difference between myself and others. The 7th century Christian mystic Saint Isaac asks, quote, what is a charitable heart? It is a heart which is burning with love for the whole creation, for men, for the birds, for the beasts, for all creatures. He who has such a heart cannot see or call to mind a creature without his eyes being filled with tears by reason of the immense compassion which seizes his heart a heart which is softened and can no longer bear to see or learn from others of any suffering, even the smallest pain being inflicted upon a creature. That is why such a man never ceases to pray for the animals, moved by the infinite pity which reigns in the hearts of those who are becoming united with God. John Wesley, the 18th century founder of Methodism, writes, quote, I believe in my heart that faith in Jesus Christ can and will lead us beyond an exclusive concern for the well-being of other human beings to the broader concern for the well-being of the birds in our backyards, the fish in our rivers, and every living creature on the face of the earth. The 9th century Islamic Sufi saint Misery says, quote, never think of anyone as inferior to you. Open the inner eye and you will see the one glory shining in all creatures. Albert Einstein, he's another one of these great mystics, I think, articulates it in this way. A human being is a part of the whole, called by us the universe, a part limited in time and space. He experiences himself, his thoughts and feelings, as something separated from the rest, a kind of optical delusion of his consciousness. This delusion is a kind of prison for us, restricting us to our personal desires and to affection for a few persons nearest to us. Our task must be to free ourselves from this prison by widening our circle of compassion to embrace all living creatures and the whole of nature in its beauty. And then I just write here, by breaking the blinding grip of materialism, we can see the subtle connections that link us all to each other. So, and then I go on talking about how thoughts and feelings have power. Um, yeah, I think uh, somehow the speakers cut out there. And, um, it's better now. Okay, thanks. So, um, so this is, uh, the point is, and I could give a lot more quotes, but the point is that people who are, have been following a spiritual path authentically in any tradition, uh, throughout history have come to this basic realization uh, you know, authentically uh, that ha human happiness depends on compassion for all life, for all living beings. And it's very interesting to look back, you know, if you look at the Jain tradition, I've been doing quite a bit in the Jain tradition lately. Um, they're having me speak at their conferences around the country and actually they flew us to England to speak there. Uh, the Jain tradition is well known in India for being vegetarian. I mean, they do not eat meat. However, they do eat dairy traditionally. 
And uh, so the, the, the main teacher in the Jain tradition, his name is Sri Chichubanuji, he's about 83 years old, beautiful person. He's, he's walked thousands and thousands of miles. He lived just walking around India and barefoot for like 30 years. And um, he is a vegan. And so he's been basically using me to try to convince everybody else in the Jains to be vegan. He's like, look at this guy, he's a real Jain, you know, he's a vegan. <laughs> so I'm the real, they go, you're a real Jain, you know. <laughs> Because there's so much violence in dairy. I have a whole chapter in the World Peace Diet called The Domination of the Feminine that just basically uh, goes deeply into the violence in dairy. I won't go into it right now, but um, there's so much violence in dairy for, at, the, at the very core and in really in all animal agriculture towards the feminine principle primarily and towards the female body and, and, and the babies and stealing the babies and, and continual raping of the female and stealing her babies. I mean, it's really hideous. The, the whole you know, reduction of this essentially sacred beings that we know when we look at animals, we, we have a feeling of here's an expression of life that wants to celebrate his or her life and that they have a purpose that every uh, animal, every, all of us, all beings have a, a purpose. We have a part to play within the unfolding of the ecosystem on this earth and probably many other levels higher than that. And when we take an animal, <laughs> we call it you know, an animal, we're also animals, I mean we're mammals that Anyway, but we take, you know, so-called animal and sort of rip them out of the ecosystem and put them into some kind of a confined situation. Even if we just let them live there and don't kill them and steal them and eat them and all this stuff, it's an essential act of violence. We're, we're tearing them out of the web and making them in some way serve our purposes. And so we have to disconnect from our inherent wisdom and compassion to do that. So it's an essential act of violence not only against them, but against ourselves, against our own wisdom, against our own sense of being at home in a benevolent universe, because we are not being benevolent. We are doing what we would not want to have done to us. That's the essential spiritual teaching is don't do to others what you don't want to have done <laughs> to yourself. And we break that essential rule, you know, 75 million times a day we're killing animals uh, for food in this country. So we're not talking about just sort of a little, uh, and we'll, you know, the, the abuse of animals for food in this culture is not just a little sort of side story. It is the thing that's happening. It's by far the biggest activity of human beings on this planet is the killing of animals for food. It's massive. You know, we, we ignore it. We don't talk about it in the media, but it's huge. It's, you know, you go into any, any one of these buildings, any store, any, uh, I mean, any place where there's a refrigerator and open it, you'll find the flesh and secretions of brutalized animals. I mean, it's pervasive. You can't escape it. Every house, every everywhere. So, uh, and we're e and we're actually eating that stuff. So we're taking in the, the those vibrations, <clears throat> which, is, which is basically what that the the chapter um, on metaphysics of food is about. That because we're doing this on such a massive level, and we've been doing it uh, actually for only eight thousand years. It's not uh, something we've been doing for a long time in terms of actually owning animals as, as objects to be used. Um, because we're doing that, that I think we live essentially in a very materialistic culture. The materialism is the logical outcome of centuries of dominating animals. And, if we're, and it's a view where we, we say the only reality is that which we can measure. And uh, with the Zen tradition, for example, I was going to say this earlier on, uh, and all the spiritual traditions are saying is that there's the physical reality um, which we call the world of phenomena, phenomena, but there's also what's called the, the noumenal reality, or the, the world out of which this world emerges and to which it eventually returns. And that's our true nature. You know, there's this old koan in the Zen tradition. What is the sound of one hand clapping? Has anyone ever heard of that? You know, what is the sound of one hand clapping? And you, you know, you hear people trying to like, because <laughs> we know this, right? This, this is the sound of two hands clapping. That's, basically that's, Religious traditions are always symbolic, you know, so this represents the world that we can hear, see, taste, touch, smell, think about, the world of form, that we, then our culture says that's all there is. But the, word, the sound of one hand clapping is basically, it's a question that's designed to turn our mind to the silence out of which the songs emerge and to which eventually they all return again. You know, it, like last night when I was playing the piano, um, that piano was just sitting there and it wasn't making any music, right? At least that we could hear. And then at some point, conditions, karmic causes, 
came together and suddenly it was making music. You know, so music came out of silence, and but it, you know, it went for a while and then eventually, of course, silence takes over again. <laughs> and all of us, I think, can be. I think we just lost the speaker again. Um, all of us can be seen essentially, I think, as a, as songs. You know, each one of us is born and we sing our song and we do our dance and then at a certain point we return to silence. All life, all forms, everything emerges out of silence, returns to silence, and silence contains the potential for everything. And it's this, you know, we use words like God or spirit or the infinite or the absolute or whatever, or, or, you know, we, or, there's different uh, words that we use, but the idea is to connect with, with, on, in an authentic way with the, with the source of life and when we do that we see the, interconnection, the interconnectedness of everything. And the essential teachings are that in order for us to be able to raise our consciousness, we have to change our behavior. We have to bring our behavior into alignment with the truth that we want to awaken to. And so, um, you know, Madeline, my wife Madeline and I live in an RV, as Dan said, for the last 14 years. And basically what I've been doing is, wor is working through progressive churches, through Unity, Religious Science, Unitarian, uh, some you know different non-denominational progressive churches uh, on Sunday morning pretty much every Sunday morning I'm standing there talking to people about spirituality and one of the things that I found is that in, our, in this culture people think we have this basic idea that we can raise our consciousness and as we do that as we raise our consciousness to a higher and higher level that our behavior will naturally become better right well this our behavior will become more in alignment with our consciousness as our consciousness gets higher and what people fail to realize is that our behavior, not only does our consciousness determine our behavior, you know, that's true. I mean, what they're saying is true, but <laughs> it also goes the other way. Our behavior determines our consciousness. And so our consciousness is not going to go any higher than the level of our behavior. It's not. It will not go higher than the level of our behavior. So if we're acting in ways that are violent, like we are in this culture. I mean, how, what's the percentage of people in the United States that are vegan? I mean, it's only maybe one or two percent. So we've got, but we've got lots of people trying to live a spiritual life, but they're, they're basically paying other brothers and sisters to stab animals, to hyper-confine, mutilate, kill them, and all that. And in any court of law, we know that the, it's the one who pays the assassin is far more guilty than the assassin themselves. The assassin's just you know, he's just killing because he's paid to do it. But it's the person who wills it, who says, get that guy for me. You know, that's the real, that's the karma. And so we have, everyone we see walking around is, is, is initiating acts of enormous violence and then feeling essentially at a very deep level guilty about it, blocking the awareness of that and having essentially very low self-esteem. We, we live in a culture of people with low self-esteem. We don't feel good about ourselves. Why don't we feel good about ourselves? Because of the food. Little children are forced into eating the flesh of brutalized animals at an early age, and it's very terrible for them. I mean, I'll tell you a story. This is shocking to me. It was shocking to me, but um, I remember a few years ago, I was at a, I, I was putting on a retreat on developing intuition, uh, in Kansas City at the, at the Unity um, headquarters. And we were sitting in a circle, and I, and I just told a little bit about the World Peace Diet, and, and I, I told this very briefly a story about how when I was um, about 13 years old, I went to this Vermont dairy farm as part of a summer camp, and how we not only kill our own chicken, but we also killed our own cow. There was, you know, the cows basically on an organic dairy, like on any dairy, after when they get to be about four years old, and a cow would live, you know, to be 25 or so, um, their production drops off because they've been pushed so hard to give much more milk than they normally would and they're kept pregnant and lactating simultaneously. So anyway, we, we were there and the, and the dairy operator said, well, you know, this cow's not giving enough milk, so we're gonna, instead, we're gonna use it for meat. You know, if you can't use them. The animals are here for the four M's, meat, milk, manure, and money. So you, that's their purpose. We, you know, we steal their purpose and we say, you know, this is their purpose, it's the four M's. And so we're gonna use it for, um, for meat now. And, I remember I talked about how we got gathered around the cow and we shot the cow in the head with a gun and we cut her thing and blood everywhere. And, and uh, I remember she was um, sitting, there was this one woman who was, when I started talking about this, who got real, so uncomfortable, she was like squirming around in her chair. And, uh, but she, did, she didn't say anything. And, and, uh, and then later on, 
uh, she, uh, they, they, they had a vegetarian option, you know, and uh, she said, I want the vegetarian option. <laughs> and I was glad, I said, oh, that's good. And, um, and then like, two days later, it was all over, and she came up to me and she said, I just want to talk to you for a, a few minutes about what I went through. And I said, okay. She said, you know, when you were talking about what that, that cow was going through on the dairy and how you killed the cow, she said, I was so upset with you for bringing that up because I was thinking, you know, I mean, what does it matter? I mean, it's just a cow. We have human beings are starving. Human beings are getting killed in wars. Why should we care about cows? They're just cows. That's what she was thinking. That's why she was so upset. And it's so interesting to me. But then she said, later in the retreat, in a, in a, she had this experience. I won't go into it. But anyway, she, she had an experience where she, where she had some repressed memories came to the surface. And she said she knew that she had been raised, actually, as a little girl in a satanic cult in New Orleans, in New Orleans, New Orleans. Uh, and, but she had blocked a lot of the memories. And so she said it, some of the memories came up and she was really kind of shaken up by some of these memories. And she, um, she said, I, I just want to tell you, I, re I started remembering some of the rituals, the satanic rituals that we did. And she said, what they were essentially was we would kill animals. I mean, not we, they, they, you know, they would kill animals and then they made us go up to these, the, these ant, the, the meat, you know, they would kill the animal, then they'd make, make me go up on my knees and, um, and eat the flesh of these animals. And I said, wow, I said, was it cooked or raw? And she said, sometimes it was uh, raw and sometimes it was cooked. And I thought, you know, that's not so far from what I had to go through <laughs> eating my father's barbecues. You know? I mean, I realized in a certain sense, we're raised in a satanic cult. You know, that's what this culture essentially is. I mean, if you really look at it, I mean, we force children to eat the flesh of animals that have been stabbed. And, it, and she said, and what she said was, she said, I felt so dirty. I felt so terrible about myself for, for you know, I felt like such a terrible person for, for eating the flesh of these animals. And that's when I started to make some of these connections about self-esteem and how people know that, I mean, corporations know that people who have low self-esteem make the best consumers. You know, they'll buy anything to try to feel better about themselves. You know, if you want to, if you want to have people, if you want to make a lot of money as a corporation you, and make a lot of money as a pharmaceutical corporation, you want to have people who are sick and don't feel good about themselves. They don't have power. They just will buy and do and they'll believe whatever you, you tell them. And, you know, so what veganism essentially is, as I've been saying, is, is learning to look with eyes that see beings rather than seeing things, and that this is the essential spiritual act. You know, it's, it's, and, and we cannot do it to others unless we really do it to ourselves. Until we see ourselves as essentially spiritual, as, as consciousness, as life manifesting through a vehicle, but we're not just this form, we are life itself, and we begin to see others that way, and we begin to see all living beings that way, then, we, then it, what is born within us is a sense of respect and kindness for these, for these expressions of life and a, a natural sense of wanting the best for them. And that this is the foundation not only of happiness for them, because we'll treat them kindly and, we'll, and, and so forth, but also for ourselves. And so what are, somehow we've been born into a culture that, and I talk about it in the World Peace Diet, I won't go into it here, but somehow uh, this uh, a powerful elite emerged that has created these institutions that program the people that are born here primarily through food and eating uh, into a mentality of reductionism and violence and commodification of life and predation. We create a very predatory economic systems and this makes people very easily controlled, easily enslaved and they don't even realize it, honestly. Don't even realize You can tell them all kinds of lies, they believe it. The official stories are full of, li of lies. You know, that you, you will be sick unless you have pharmaceuticals and that animals don't have a soul. You'll die if you don't eat animal protein. And you know, all these, these truths that we know are so true, uh, are, are these official stories are all false. And so we're, we're easily misled and easy, because we're mi easily misled on the, f on the food on our plate. We're eating disconnectedness and, and lies with every meal. And we're internalizing that directly. It becomes the cells. I mean, you're eating, when we eat something, it really becomes the body that we're eating. That's why we should be eating things that are grown with love and caring and nurturing and we're eating love and we will be loved. You cannot build a tower of peace and love and wisdom with bricks of cruelty and violence. 
And that's what our food is. It's what we build this tower of. What are we going to build this tower, this beacon of light? Can we ever build a beacon of light with, with darkness and horror and misery and terror and grief? And I remember my, um, my niece used to have these panic attacks when she was going to college. She was 20, 21, 22 years old. And I said, listen, go vegan and you'll stop having panic attacks. <laughs> and it really worked. You know, she stopped eating animal foods and dairy products and the panic attacks went away. I mean, so, because we're eating panic, you know, we're eating terror, we're eating fear. People have nightmares. People have all kinds of, you know, depression, anxiety, frustration. What are they eating? They're eating depression, anxiety, frustration, and insomnia. That's what all of these animals are experiencing. They are experiencing exactly that. I and mean, if you're a cow and you're having your baby stolen every single day and you're forced, you can't move. I mean, it's a horrific experience. People knew in the old days that a woman who was breastfeeding her baby, if she was angry or upset, her milk would make the baby sick. You know, the hormones and the energy, whatever, the baby, you know. So they knew that they should never, ever, ever nurse if they were not in a positive state of mind. They would really be, that would be bad for the baby. And, and yet we're nursing at the teats of dairy cows who are absolutely miserable and in panic and terror and fear. And we're drinking that, not only all the, the actual physical toxins in milk, like IGF-1 growth hormone and casein and uh, all these other hormones that we should never as human beings be taking in, but we're eating, we're drinking all the, and taking in uh, all the terror and fear and panic as well. And so how could we feed that to our loved ones? How could we feed that to ourselves? What are the ramifications of doing that? Well, we can see what the ramifications of that are. We create a culture that is insane, basically. I mean, we're just completely devastating the life support systems on this planet. We, we have rates of suicide in, among teenagers that are uh, higher than they've ever been and we just ignore it. And so I think we have to understand that the healing of our culture comes essentially back to seeing food uh, as, a spirit, as our connection with spirit. And this is something uh, that every culture has uh, understood. I, uh, the first chapter of the World Peace Diet goes into this in more depth, but the basic idea is that there's no the most intimate connection we have with the larger order is through food, is through eating. And so every culture has recognized that food is sacred. And you have in the, in the, in the Western tradition, I mean, in Christianity, this whole idea of communion, you know, this idea of, uh, of eating uh, the body of, the, of, of Christ, you know, this, this idea of, uh, is, is a very, you know, it's, it's symbolic of something very profound. And other traditions have similar ideas that food, that eating is, 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 the, is the symbol of, part, of the infinite partaking of itself through itself, and we are manifestations of that. And so the, um, the basic idea is that we need to bring our behavior, uh, including food, into alignment with the ideals that we want to live. And uh, so one of the, let's maybe make up here a couple of, a, couple of, uh, a list of a couple of ideas. Um, in, the, in the Buddhist tradition, uh, and this is actually universal, there's what are called the five precepts. Have you heard of the five precepts? The five precepts are the way that we behave, because I was talking about earlier how we can raise our consciousness only to the level of our behavior. So when I was in the Zen monastery in Korea, for example, not only did we meditate from three o'clock in the morning till nine o'clock at night, you know, it was just meditate, meditate. You know. uh, and I was in silence for, for uh, three months um, <clears throat> meditating, you know, but not only that, we were supposed, we were, the whole idea was to live our life according to the five precepts. Actually, there's more than five. They, for the monks, they give you like 150. But for the, for the, lay, for the typical people, it's, there's five precepts. And these sum up everything, okay? So these are the five precepts. Um, one is yeah, no killing. I'll just put no, okay? No killing. No stealing is number two. Um, number three is um, no lying. Number four is no uh, basically sexual misconduct, whatever you call that. And um, number five is no, I'll just put uh, drugs. Um, but it, what it really means is no, and these are mainly for, on, for oneself and for others. So not forcing others not, not taking the life of others, not stealing from others, not trying to deceive others, not, tr not abusing others sexually, not seeing others as sexual objects to be used in some way, and not forcing drugs or alcohol onto others uh, without their consent and not, you know, not, not being a drug pusher, I guess, <laughs> in a way. Um, 
And what's so interesting to me is that these are, five, these, are five, these are the five universal taboos. Every culture in the world, has, if you do that to someone in the culture who they respect I and mean, whose interests are protected, uh, you will pay the consequences in some way. You'll be, you know, somehow something will happen. So, and when you think about it though, those five things are what we do to animals routinely. And the people who do that to animals have the highest positions of honor and respect in our culture. Ranchers, dairy operators, I mean, they have the most powerful voice in Congress. They're, they run things, you know. Animals used for food are systematically killed, right? We don't have to talk about that. They're killed, their purposes are killed, every dimension of their being is destroyed. They are stolen from, their purposes are stolen, their babies are stolen, their time is stolen, their lives are stolen. There's nothing that they have that is not stolen from them. They are deceived. I mean, Temple Grandin is sort of, everybody thinks she's so great because she's created somehow these, these slaughterhouse entryways that are kind of curved that deceive the, the animals into thinking that they're not going to be killed. <laughs> so they're more calm when they're killed somehow. They're not freaking out. So that's supposed to be better, you know, somehow for the animals and for, well, maybe better for the operators. It's better for their profits. But the whole deception, I remember as a kid, you know, fishing, you're trying to get a lure that'll trick the fish, you know, this whole idea, this whole idea of deception. And to me, I just have to say this, there's something going on in this culture right now that to me is really hor hor horrific, which is the idea of happy meat and happy dairy and, ha you know, somehow you can, you can have these free range animals and you can give them names and you can care about them and you, you know, you can sort of, and then, and then what? And then it's the ultimate betrayal. Then you, and then you come up and you just stab them. I mean, that I think is in some ways even more brutal to the animals and to ourselves than, than the horrific typical treatment that they get because there's such a, a level of deception involved in that and people somehow feel great. Now, I've, I've talked to people who are vegetarians uh, and now they're eating meat again because they say, well, now it's organic and free range and uh, it's cruelty free. You know, no cruelty involved. They, they are nice when they kill the animals. So this, I think, is a direct result. They don't, people don't realize the, uh, the, the, if that was done to human beings or even to dogs or cats, everybody would be outraged. But since it's chickens and pigs and cows, they think, well, it's good. <laughs> uh, and sexual misconduct, of course, I mean, the, 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 that's, no, all the animals are artificially, uh, you know, they call a rape rack and it's um, very painful, it's terrifying. Even, even um, cows like uh, on organic dairies, I remember uh, here, talking to this woman, she said, uh, well, when a veterinarian comes to, to impregnate the cow, uh, the cow, the cow, no, they only had one cow, it's just a little small operation. So whenever, whenever she hears that truck, she knows it's a veterinarian truck, she's running <laughs> the other way as fast as she can go. Uh, but I think we have to, and also, where do they get the sperm for these, for these sperm guns? I mean, I, I also had knew, met a woman who lived across the street from one of the operations in Ithaca, New York, where they had these bulls with, which they masturbate to get their sperm. I mean, this is, this is typical, it's, anyway, it's very sexually, mis there's a lot of sexual misconduct going on in these operations. And then drugs, there's massive amounts of drugs that are forced onto these animals. Uh, as, as I said the other day, over 10,000 different pharmaceutical drugs are forced onto animals. So what we're doing, as a culture, even though we would protect in many ways, uh, thank you, those of us um, who are in this room, you know, if, if people did these things to us, uh, we would be protected, hopefully. But we have a whole class of beings who have interests like we have, whose interests we do not in any way uh, protect. And so this, I think, is the essential driving fury in our, in our culture that causes us to disconnect spiritually. So uh, I was just told I only have 10 minutes left, so I'm gonna just kind of wrap things up here. The basic thing is, for us as human beings, to live a life that's authentic, that has meaning, that has a, a, the possibility for inner peace and freedom and joy and creativity and abundance and all that we desire truly, our consciousness and our behavior must be aligned. If my consciousness is saying, yes, I believe in peace and joy and freedom, 
and at the uh, but but not, I just have to like a good burger <laughs> and uh, and cheese or something. You know, there's a such a disconnection there that it re it makes all of our efforts merely ironic. And that I think is the situation that our culture is in today. We our efforts for peace and sustainability and justice and equality are merely ironic. We want for ourselves but we refuse to give others. The essential spiritual teachings of all the religions uh, are, are being completely ignored and no one even knows why. I mean, the, the great irony is that this culture, if we, if we don't awaken, which I, I think we will, but if we don't awaken, we will self-destruct and we'll never even know why it happened. We won't even, we won't even know why. We have no idea. We will, and that's the path we're going down. Uh, of environmental devastation, uh, the weaponization of pharmaceuticals, the weaponization of space, the weaponization of everything, and uh, the reduction of freedom, uh, you know, of, of a microchipped society. I mean, we're right now going into a microchip in all animals. That's laws just been passed. Where people are complete, you know, the thing is, whatever we have done to animals, eventually we have done to other human beings. This is an unbroken law. Everything. I mean, in the beginning, they made electroshock prods only for animals. They never used them on humans. Not when Bush came out and said, when we torture people, we don't want to leave any marks. <laughs> so they're using a lot of electroshocks on people. And uh, this, this is standard procedure. And I think we have to realize that our violence towards animals always will boomerang. It'll always come back. It's a very, because they're us. I mean, we're <laughs> they're the same, basically. And so the spiritual frontier, the spiritual, uh, the, the next spiritual uh, dimension for us to enter into as a culture is to live in harmony with the creation, to show the creation the same respect and compassion that we would like to have for ourselves. And as we begin to do that, we'll begin to be able to live in a, a human culture that reflects that for, for us as well. And so the goal, I think, for each one of us in, in a, becoming vegan, which is simply having eyes that see beings instead of seeing things and bringing our, our, our life into alignment with that, is to, it, I think in many ways, the food is the core, it's the starting place of this, to, you know, to buy food that has the least amount of violence, it should be organic, uh, plant-based foods, the least amount of violence, the most amount of joy and freedom. And, and yet, that's just the beginning because beyond that, to live all in all of our relations with other human beings, to live in an attitude of inclusiveness. The, the, the basic mentality at the core of eating animals for food and animal products and the, the, agri the type of agriculture that we have is a direct manifestation of that. This agriculture uh, of monocropping of you know, huge, Madeline and I live in an RV, we travel, we see massive uh, monocrops of corn and soybeans and other, mainly feed grains for animals. That the, the mentality that's, that underlies that whole thing is the mentality of exclusion that is required when we eat animals for food. We have to learn early on, as we grow up, to exclude certain beings from the sphere of our compassion. What spiritual growth is, is radical inclusion. What veganism is, is radical inclusion. It's in saying, I am going to include all living beings within the sphere of my compassion. And the more we include all living beings in the sphere of my compassion, that means that we don't, we no longer have the, the, uh, the luxury, in a sense, of getting angry and blaming someone else for my problems, <laughs> and, uh, or of excluding them in some way, that we have to really learn, we're called, I think, to really learn to include everyone, to, uh, even, the, even our so-called enemies or the people who are against us somehow in whatever way we see that, to include them. It's really a, a mentality of radical inclusion. So um, uh, that's the goal, I think, and that's really what this, um, I think this teaching that's right here, we see this, uh, this whole idea of, of eating food that's living light. You know, we're, we're living in a way that is inclusive that is based on a mentality of inclusion. And when we do that, we find happiness will be born within us. So what it calls for us to do, like when I was in the Zen monastery in Korea, the idea that, is that this, you know, these rules of non-harmfulness, of, of ahimsa, is the, is the foundation of all this. I mentioned that word the other day. Ahimsa means non-violence. Non-violence is the core of, of this. We, when we live that way, 
Then when we go to meditate, we'll be, it'll be much easier to go deeply in meditation. If I'm in some way eating animal foods or harming others, when I go to meditate, my mind is going to be <laughs> busy. So, so the foundation of true meditative depth is nonviolence. The more we act in ways that are kind to others, the more at peace we are with ourselves, the better we feel about who we are, basically. The higher our self-confidence, the more we, we feel great about this beautiful life and we give a, a, have a feeling of thankfulness and joy and at this precious opportunity of a human life. And when we go to meditate, our mind goes, is at peace, we go deeper, we make an authentic connection with the transpersonal dimension of ourselves. When we go to live our life, we naturally want to bless others, we go deeper, you know, it just creates this positive circle of, of going deeper in our practice and feeling and living more in alignment with the truth that we directly experience through our meditation practice. And this is really what I would say is the universal teaching of all the uh, traditions and it is the very thing that this culture does not do. And so we have to realize that in many ways all of us, as we, even as we become vegans, we have had within our consciousness injected, unfortunately, a lot of, uh, of a lot of attitudes and beliefs and tendencies that it, through our practice we, we're called to, some, in a sense, uh, purify. So there's a, a sense of, of needing to purify our consciousness so that we become more and more aligned with the, uh, behavior, the behaviors and the attitudes become more incongruous. And that's what veganism, I think, essentially is. And as that happens, we connect more with the universal energy. We have a lot more energy and uh, creativity and new ideas. And, you know, we start to really become a force, uh, a cosmic, we become a cosmic force <laughs> on the planet, in a sense, we, because we're in alignment with the cosmic forces and uh, we allow them to move us and move through us in our life. And that's, um, I think, really the, when we know that our life is in harmony is when we have this feeling of joy uh, in our life. So. Um, I, one other thing I'll just mention, besides um, the World Peace Diet book, the other book that I've been reading lately, has, has, it, has anyone heard of Anastasia? Some, I don't know. Someone just gave me this book, and I've actually, I'm not, there's nine books, I'm, I'm on book number nine, and I think there's a, this is also very helpful because this is a woman from Russia, and um, a, a mystic, really, I think, who lives in a very profound way in the Ru Siberian wilderness, but she emphasizes, and in there is emphasized the idea, which I think is really important, how we can grow enough food easily on this planet through small-scale local organic gardens. You know, we somehow we have this idea that we have to have these huge machines and gigantic monocrop devastated places to grow it to feed a hungry world. And Cuba uh, proved that small-scale organic gardens is much more efficient and you can feed a lot more people then, then because we had this embargo against them, they couldn't get any, they couldn't do that kind of agriculture anymore. And Russia, there's, there's, she talks about in here, dachas, which are these small little farms, only, you know, half an acre. There's now something like 30 million of these in Russia, and they are producing 90 percent, 80, between 80 and 90 percent of all the vegetables and fruits and potatoes in Russia come from little tiny gardens. And it's high, high quality organic, I mean, really high quality food. They're doing it in Russia. I mean, it's amazing. I'm like, I'm like totally amazed. This is really spiritual life. This is living our life, I think, in, in harmony. You know, when we have millions of people creating gardens and touching the earth with love and growing our own food that's, that we share with each other, meditating and living a plant-based diet, we are fulfilling our purpose on this planet. And I think our purpose really is in many ways very simple. It is to be free and happy in communities. There's nothing stopping us from that. Each one of us can live that life. So just thank you all for the efforts that you're making. Keep questioning all the assumptions and bringing the spiritual power of food into your lives more fully. There's a lot more I'd like to say, but we're at the end of our time. Bless you all. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you.